Commissioner, Ministers, Excellencies, um, dear friends of the ocean, thanks a lot for the kind invitation. Um, let me say that the importance of the work of the Global Ocean Commission cannot be overstated and we have been a very proud supporter. Uh, let me take a very few minutes to share some of the insights on the economics of ocean decline and ocean recovery and provide a little bit uh, what you might call uh, a view into the kitchen. Before I do that, let me also say uh, every profession has its language. My profession um, uh, has a saying that you learn on day two, uh, not to boil the ocean. Uh, there was a lot of boiling needed, um, uh, leading the work in McKinsey on natural resources, on water, on uh, energy, land use, forests. Um, we find the oceans particularly tricky. Um, because uh, data availability is poor. Um, many of the loops and the interlinkages are very complex, and particularly the regeneration dynamics are very hard to grasp. So what we have drawn is probably more uh, a 17th century map. It's not a Google map, it's a 17th century map. Not perfect, uh, with lots of terra incognita and dragons, um, and yet uh, much better than doing the journey without a map. Uh, in the early days of the Commission, uh, in out of our discussions, we felt that there are five areas and economic questions where underpinning is needed for the work of the Commission, for the Commissioners to base their um, recommendations and their conclusions on. Five of them. The first one, what is the value, the contribution that the ocean delivers, both in a business as usual scenario and in one scenario of sustainable management. Second, what is the economics of fishery really today? Third, what it is, is it that the rich world can do? Um, what would the price be to pay uh, to <coughs> consider giving up high seas fishing, at least partially? Fourth, what could the developing world do? What would the price be to pay for stranded assets as they are retiring their fleet over capacities. And fifth, what could all of us do um, <clears throat> to close the ocean as the ultimate planetary sink, let's say for plastic. Let me quickly turn to the first point. What is the value that the ocean delivers uh, almost as an eighth continent? The ocean is providing us um, conservatively counted with 3 trillion US dollars a year. 1.4 trillion comes from non-renewable extraction, uh, largely offshore oil and gas. 800 billion comes from operational services like fish, uh, shipping. Uh, 130 billion comes from renewable extraction like tourism, agriculture, and wild fishing. In addition to that, the ocean is giving us ecosystem services beyond measure through climate regulation or genetic diversity. We try to be very conservative here because it's very easy to go overboard uh, and only look at the avoided costs of that. Carbon sequestration, avoided costs 120 billion. Uh, water purification, 120 billion. Storm protection, 100 billion. Uh, clearly, we will always be able to navigate the sea and to, and to extract oil even out of a dead ocean. However, uh, the renewable extraction, um, <clears throat> um, that is not true. And so we played with scenarios and, <clears throat> and found that a sustainable management approach might increase yields in the long term of something of the ocean by something like 100 billion US dollars a year. That again is without the upside of ecosystem services and resilience services counted. A large part of that 100 billion swing comes from fisheries, 50 billion. So let's look into our second question. What is the real economics of fishing today? The real economics of the sector has worsened dramatically in recent years. And the catch numbers, they don't tell us the full story. The aggregate catch has remained almost stable in recent years at around 80 million metric tons. However, that required marine fisheries to exploit more and more surface uh, of the ocean. In 1950, 
fisheries covered 1% of the high seas in 1980. They covered 33% of the high seas. In 2006, they covered 63% of the high seas. That led to a dramatic decline in fisheries productivity between 1975 and 2006. The catch per unit of capacity has declined by 86%. An example in the Philippines, a kilo of fish per what we call the standard unit of effort fell from 36 to 3 kilograms between 1950 and 2000, and that is affecting the livelihoods of more than 1.4 million near shore fishers. So understandably, that higher intensity of fishing has depleted fish stocks down to something like 40% of biomass of many fisheries, but it also has affected sector profitability. Um, total sector revenues are around 79 billion US dollars. The cost to operate the sector is 73 billion, capital costs 11 billion. We estimate um, that there is an overall uh, loss to the sector, um, but there are subsidies, and that creates the real surplus of the sec sector. So we are caught in the race to the bottom. Uh, that is continuing because there is 27 billion of subsidies flowing into the sector, and because of the open access character of uh, ocean fisheries with very low entry barriers and very high exit barriers. So we need to take dramatic action on three playing fields, the nearshore fisheries, the EEZs and the high seas, the nearshore fisheries accounting for 50% of the catch and 99% of employment, um, the EEZs accounting for 40% of the fisheries and about 1% of the employment, and then the high seas fisheries with 10% of the catch and, uh, <clears throat> and much less than 1% of fishery employment. So naturally, our analysis started with the high seas, but also because don't, fish don't know the boundaries, also the EEZs, um, and so lots of that is complementary to the good work that exists on nearshore fisheries. So we asked the third question, what could the rich world do? Uh, what would be the price to pay for high seas re regeneration zones? So let me take the liberty and take a fact-based look uh, at high seas fishing. Is there an economic case for declaring high seas or parts of it into regeneration zones? If today's replenishment models are correct, then there could be a case for it. Uh, per head of global population, it would cost uh, one US dollar um, for retraining and MPA supervision, and then recurrently one US dollars in loss of catch. Um, it could be compensated according to the models by higher yields in the EEZ, so four US dollars per global head of population. And so overall, we estimate a positive net present value of a high seas regeneration zone. Again, let us not underestimate the political uh, challenge of this agenda, but let's also see that 83% uh, of high sea catch goes to developed countries, so there is an equity issue at hand uh, that will not go unnoticed and developed countries have to act. But at the same time, there's also an equity issue within developing countries as well. Uh, so let's turn to EEZ fisheries for a mo moment, largely owned by developing countries, and ask, fourth question, uh, what could developing countries do? What would be the price for stranded assets as they are retiring over capacity fleets? So in developing countries, there's fierce competition between merchant fleets and the uh, artisanal nearshore fisheries. In our models, we tested a case in which 40% of developing country vessel capacity is retired. Uh, the 120,000 largest vessels with an employment of 1.3 million fishermen. In order to make this politically feasible, of course, you will have to take into account the economic and the social costs, um, and that needs to be accounted for. So, and yet, we believe that the cost of decommissioning, the cost of retraining, the lost wage and interest payments could be recouped through increased profits and phased out of subsidies. In other words, the, in this model, the stock recovery would pay for stranded asset problems. Getting there, of course, will still be a challenge and require new, scalable, 
and market-based mechanisms, regulators must create a simple tradable unit of fishery access, like limiting the days at sea, for example, that can be easily enforced. So marginal fisheries have an incentive to cash out and sell their share of the fishery and of the access rights, and that creates consolidation, good consolidation, and the exit of marginal fishers. So let's finally move to an arena which we cannot delegate to the fishery communities, but um, one where changing the economics it is actually uh, rooted in our collective behavior. So the fifth point, what can all of us do to close the ocean as the ultimate sink, uh, say, of plastics? Landfills were regarded as unlimited, so were lakes and so were rivers. Um, well, clearly they were not. The sea is still perceived as the ultimate planetary uh, sink for anything from carbon to plastic. Uh, again, could economics come to its rescue? Today we are producing 300 million tons of plastics. In 2020 it will be 540 million tons. Uh, up to 10% of that ends up in the ocean. Uh, a large part of that not visible to the eye because it's not floating on the surface. Why is this happening? Let's clearly listen, uh, very briefly listen to the story of PET versus polyethylene, uh, two blockbuster polymers that we have worked on intensively in our circular economy work. PET is pure. Uh, a ton of used material, in fact, is as expensive to buy as a ton of virgin material. And that's why every bottle is essentially snatched before it falls to the ground or before it's floated uh, to the ocean. It's recycled or it's reused. Polyethylene uh, comes in hundreds and thousands of formulations with different colors, different uh, uh, retardants, different catalysts, different softeners. It's impure and a ton of used polyethylene actually has a value of zero. And that's why no one snatch it is, is as it falls to the ground. Let me be very clear, uh, there is a lot of PET in the sea. And yet, 50% of the PET is in fact collected and reused, and that number could, through better management, be massively increased. We believe, based on our models, uh, that the global economy could save 100 billion US dollars a year simply by recovering more plastic. Uh, and that is even before we start to purify and homogenize the zoo of plastics that we have created. It is a question of economics uh, to get the plastic question right. Uh, let's tell everyone a story that two days global plastic supply chain is creating costs twice and it's losing money twice. Once, as we are not recovering that value, and second, as we are clogging uh, what seems to be the last global sink, our oceans. So let me conclude. What do all of these points have in common? There is an economic case to get it right. Uh, it is unfortunately hidden behind complex relationships, short-term interests and entrenched behavior. Whilst the Commission has drawn its very own conclusions and recommendations from the fact that um, scientists and also McKinsey has provided, uh, we agree that there is a case for the oceans that stands very firmly on the ground of good old economics. And that is, I believe, not a bad starting point for the Ocean Committee and hopefully an encouragement to political decision makers in this room and beyond. Thank you. Thank you.